So today I want to go back to the whole area of testing and automated testing. So on Moodle, if you go into the uh, that particular section, then there's a new set of slides here, and we're going to be looking at web API testing. So at this stage now, we've covered the three main kind of layers of testing when it comes to web apps. Uh, unit testing, end-to-end -end testing, and web API testing. In real life, I guess you would do web API testing before you would do end-to-end -end testing, but I had to delay our discussion on web API testing until we had covered that topic in the Web Active 2 module. So let's work our way through these slides. And fortunately, you know, a lot of the uh, issues we're already familiar with from uh, both unit testing and end-to-end -end testing. So uh, perhaps the old name for our more traditional name for web API testing might be integration or subsystem testing, but uh, the more modern term would be to talk about uh, API testing. And when you're talking about API testing, we know this notion of having a test target well, clearly the target of our test in this case is the API, or more specifically, it would be the various endpoints that make up your API. So for example, in relation to the development that you're doing in Web App Dev 2, the API that you're developing has a number of endpoints at the moment anyway, it has a movies endpoint, a user's endpoint, a genre endpoint, and there may be others. And so we're, they, we are testing those individual endpoints and we regard those endpoints as black boxes. This is the term we used before. What that means in the context of web API testing is for each endpoint, you know what various verbs it supports like get, put, post, and delete. You know the URLs uh, that it supports and you know what the responses for each of those uh, for each aspect of the endpoint should be. You know all of that. You don't really know or care about the internal workings of the endpoints. Uh, that might be an issue for unit testing, but when you're doing API, API testing, you treat the endpoints as black boxes. You know how the interface to them works. Uh, and you know what the responses back should be. And that's the mindset that you have when you're doing your API testing. Uh, so again, it's focused on the, what the API does rather than how it does it. Um, I'm saying here as well that more than likely your API is communicating with a some sort of persistence layer, a database. Um, and that may be of interest to you. It may be part of the scope of your API testing and it will be in our case. Uh, so it's part of the that subsystem uh, and the integration between the API and the database. That would be part of your concern when you're doing uh, API testing. In terms of principles, it's everything that we know about so far, they all apply again. So, you know, you can apply this normal boundary error kind of idea to designing your various test cases. Errors obviously would be if you, for example, uh, let's say in the movies API, if you pass it an invalid uh, movie ID, then you should get back an error response. Uh, or if you try to post a new movie, let's say you try to add a new movie to user's list of favorites and if the movie id is invalid then you should get an appropriate error response or if you try to add the same favorite movie more than once then you should get an error response or indeed if you're trying to add a completely new movie to the movies database and some parts of that movie data structure is invalid for example one of the attributes of a movie would be its rating and maybe the rating has to be between one and five, but if you pass it a rating of 100, then perhaps you should have some validation in your API that catches that and returns back an appropriate response. Uh, boundary might apply to that as well, you know, give it a, an actual rating of five or a rating of zero. Uh, 
uh, normal is what we would deal with ordinarily. The get uh, given when then uh, kind of structure applies, you know, given, for example, given the database has a certain list of favorites for a user, when we try to add a new favorite to that user's list of favorites, then it should return whatever the specification of that particular endpoint should be. It should return a 200 or a 201 for, for perhaps status code, and maybe it returns the full list of favorites. It depends on what the specification for the endpoint is. So that all kind of applies still. Test isolation is always important. We know what that means. Uh, test targets state. The state in this case really relates to the database. What is the state of the database after you have uh, tested a particular aspect of an endpoint? Uh, if the database should have changed, then did it actually change? And the silent principle we know from before as well. Now, in terms of uh, expectations or stating expectations uh, within your test cases, then you know these are some examples of the things you might be uh, trying to express in your expectation logic. Uh, did it return the right response status? Uh, is the content type that was returned by the API what you expected it to be, i.e. application JSON? In our case, there are other response types as well, content types as well, like application XML, application text. Um, is the structure of the response, so if a particular endpoint returns some data, is the structure of that data, uh, in other words, its schema, is it what it should should be and more specifically you know is the particular key value pairs within the response because usually if we think of it's the response as being in json format then the json is essentially a set of key value pairs uh, are the various key values correct not only is the structure correct but is the are the actual values correct uh, so no, no surprises here really um uh, are there specific keys within the payload, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just examples of the types of things that we would be checking for in our test cases. Uh, of course, now our test code now is going to be communicating with an asynchronous target, as in the target doesn't respond immediately. That was not the case when we were doing unit testing, if you remember. So that does slightly, uh, well, it's, it's an issue we need to be concerned about. It shouldn't complicate things too much for us. Hopefully whatever framework or libraries we use will take care of that, but we need to be aware of it. And uh, I'm saying here that we will be using Mocha Again, so that's good. We, we we know all about Mocha and how it allows us to structure our test code. But the the important thing to be aware of about Mocha is that uh, we now need to get our Mocha test cases to wait for the target to respond back. So we'll see how we actually do that. It, uh, Mocha doesn't do it automatically. And just to elaborate on that a little bit, so here's a very simple Mocha uh, test case. And let's supposing we don't actually have any expectation statements inside in our it block. Now, uh, if we ran this particular test case, then you might expect it to pass. And of course it would pass because there's no expectation statement in here, which would cause this particular test to fail. So that's fine, that's as we would expect. Uh, let's supposing we have an asynchronous target and all I'm gonna do in this little example now is simulate the notion of an asynchronous target. So you can see here in my it block, I'm calling set timeout, that's a standard JavaScript function. It's got nothing to do with web APIs now. And I'm assuming you know how the set timeout function works. What the set timeout does is it you, you, you pass it a, function and this is our function here it's very simple and it will execute that function after a certain period of time has elapsed in my case 
I've asked it to execute it after 400 milliseconds have elapsed. Either way, uh, the body of this callback that we pass the set timeout does not execute immediately. And so that's sufficient to demonstrate the notion of an asynchronous piece of code working inside our it block. And inside it, I have an expectation statement. I'm expecting foo to be true. And up here, I've just hard coded foo to be false. So this expectation statement is going to fail. Therefore, we would expect that this test will fail. The problem though is it's actually going to pass. And the reason it's going to pass is because of what I mentioned on the previous slide, which is that by default, Mocha does not wait for asynchronous code to execute to completion. So it, it doesn't actually wait the 400 milliseconds until this piece of code here executes. What Mocha will do is it will report back to the user immediately. Uh, and as I said up here, if there's no expectation statement, so as far as Mocha is concerned, it never executed any expectation statement here. Uh, and so it would report back that this test will pass. What we want is we want Mocha to wait until this piece of code here has executed. Okay, so the point is Mocha will report back the result of your test cases uh, immediately. It doesn't wait for asynchronous targets to execute to completion. How do we get Mocha to do that? And uh, it's, it's not a new problem, so it's been well known for uh, from the outset. So it, there is actually a solution built into Mocha. And it's through this special callback function, which uh, we refer to as the done function. So I'm seeing here that Mocha does not wait. Or I've mentioned that already. And so here's how we actually get Mocha to wait for us. So here's my uh, the same, or is it the same, the almost the exact same uh, test case as the previous slide. But you'll notice here that in the function that I'm passing to the it block, I am also including an argument. Now, you can call this anything you want to, but the convention is to call it the argument done. Now, of course, behind the scenes, what Mocha does is Mocha actually calls this function for us. I mean, that was the case even back here, right? It calls, uh, it calls the function for us, and similarly down here. But it seems that uh, you can get Mocha to pass an argument to that function. And in this case, the argument is actually something that Mocha provides itself. So done here is a special function that Mocha will pass in to our function. And the purpose of this done function is Mocha is going to wait until your code calls this done function. And when your code does call it, it's only then that Mocha will report the outcome of the particular test case. And you can see here, I'm calling the done function after my expectation statement has been evaluated. And so that's going to solve the problem for me because now uh, Mocha is not going to report back the outcome of my test case until this function has been called. And so we'd get the result that we expected. So what am I doing? I'm setting foo to false. I'm expressing here that I expect foo to be true. So this test is now going to fail as indeed it should. Have, should. This is still going to, you know, it's still going to execute this 400 milliseconds uh, in the future, if you like. But because I've got this special done function, which Maka provides me with, uh, I'm getting Mocha now to wait the 400 milliseconds uh, plus, I guess, uh, before or until it actually outputs the results back to the screen telling me whether my test passed or failed or not. Similarly, over here, in this case, I'm setting foo to true. I'm stating that I expect it to be true. So again, this test case should pass and it will pass, but it will pass 
uh, because it has evaluated this expectation statement. And only then after doing that, does it actually report back to the user or to, uh, to the tester. So that's this done function. That's how we essentially get Mocha to, to wait for us. You know, if, if, for example, which would be silly, if we switch the position of these two uh, lines of code here, then this test is going to pass because I'm telling Maka, I'm telling it up here, you can now report the outcome of my test, but of course it hasn't evaluated the expectation statement yet. So that test will pass, but typically the done is, is the very last statement in your, uh, in your code within your it block. There's another problem, uh, and it is related to a timeout issue. So here again, we've got the same kind of uh, test case. And here I'm asking in my set timeout, I want it to wait 4,000 milliseconds or four seconds, in other words. Uh, now we'd expect, based on what I said on the previous slide, I'm setting foo to false. I expect foo to be false. So uh, setting for to the defaults. So I probably would have been better to let's say if I'd set that to true. Well, either way, uh, let's leave it as it is. So I'd expect this test to be successful to just say it passed successfully. The problem though is uh, when I execute it, I'm going to get an error like this. It's actually going to fail. But in this case, the failure is related to a timeout issue. Uh, because here I'm actually, I'm trying to get my asynchronous code to execute in 4,000 milliseconds in the future. But by default, Maka will only wait for a maximum of 2,000 milliseconds or two seconds. That's its default setting. And so because uh, my test does not complete in time, then I get this timeout issue. You also get this timeout issue if you were doing proper web API testing and the API that you were communicating with was a very slow API. So how do we solve this timeout problem? Well, not surprisingly, okay, there is a default timeout, but we can uh, change that default timeout. So whenever you see this kind of error popping up for your test cases, then you need to change the default timeout that you want Mocker to wait for, uh, to wait for, for uh, its, uh, its slow asynchronous code. And so if we want to do it from the command line, we can do it like this. So now the test that I had on the previous slide is going to pass because I'm telling Mocker, wait up to 5,000 milliseconds before you uh, throw your timeout error. And because on the previous slide, my asynchronous code is what is going to run after 4,000 milliseconds, then this test will execute to completion. This expectation will be true. Uh, therefore, the overall test will pass. And so I'll get the normal kind of successful test in that case. You can also set this timeout via a configuration file, and we'll see that in the lab. Okay, uh, so uh, as is clear from now, we're going to be using Mocker again for web API testing. Uh, we're going to be using a framework called SuperTest, and that is specifically uh, written as a HTTP client. So it's for spe specifically for communicating with web APIs, but it has, as, as well as allowing us to code, uh, to implement communicating with a web API, it also has some basic expectations statements built into it uh, to allow us to check for various, uh, or to make various assertions as we'll see in a moment. And thirdly, we'll be using Chai, which we're familiar with uh, from before. We'll be using Chai mainly to make more specific expectation statements about the body of a response that comes back. Really, the expectation statements that are built into SuperTest allow us to only make 
basic kind of assertions, like was the status quo in the response what I expected it to be? Um, was the content type of the response what I expected it to be? In other words, we can make uh, expectation statements about various headers uh, in the response. Whereas if we want to make expectation statements about the detail of the body of the response that came back, then we would use chai for that. So super test is the only new part of this jigsaw. And uh, what I'm showing you here is how we actually use super test to essentially make HTTP calls. Uh, so I'm importing it in the usual way. Uh, here I'm importing it. So request is actually going to be a function that I will use. What I'm also importing here is the Express API or the Express app. So that uh, that's being imported from your web API development. Okay, if I just maybe flip over to VS Code. Here we go. Uh, here's the movies API that you've been working on in the lab. And in the index.js file, where is my index.js? Here we go. That's where you've created your express app. Uh, am I looking at the right file? Just one second now. I am, yes. Okay. So oh yeah. Okay, this is where we create our express app and we build it up. Well, that is essentially is what I am. Uh, referring to here. So I import that. And here's how I make my HTTP call. So I pass a reference to my express app to this request function that I've imported. Now, by the way, you do not have to, uh, you do not have to start your, uh, your express app from the command line. What the super test will do is it will start it automatically for you. That's just by the way. So anyway, just to continue this. So clearly what I'm doing here is I'm trying to make a HTTP get request to my particular API. And the particular endpoint that I'm trying to target is the slash movies, uh, slash API slash movies. And that's that was a valid route, if you remember. That's a valid route within my movies API. I'm setting the uh, the accept header, that's the request header, to be application JSON. So in other words, I'm telling my API, I expect, or I'm 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 I only want to receive application JSON in the response. And here we go. Here's our expectation statement. So this is the expectation statement that has built into super test. And clearly what I'm doing here is I'm stating that I expect the status code and the response that comes back to be a 200. The, the end part of this chain here, that's where you can do more detailed uh, expectation statements on the body of the response. So the end function, it takes a callback and in the callback, you can specify the an error response if an error response came back from your API or the actual response uh, itself, the response body, let's say. So uh, this function here is going to be invoked by SuperTest. And what it's going to pass into this function is either the response that came back or the error that came back. And so inside here, typically, we would have expectation statements about the actual content of the response that came back. So that's a simple uh, HTTP call using super test. And also uh, I'm showing you how you would integrate your expectation statements into uh, this code where the expectation statements are based on what response came back from the web API.
Here's another illustration. This time uh, I'm illustrating how we make a HTTP POST request. So here's my POST. Uh, here's the indication that it's a POST request. This is the particular endpoint that I'm uh, directing my POST request at. And of course, with a POST request, you're going to have some payload associated with the request. And we would uh, specify the payload in this send function. And again, uh, from here on down now, I'm concerned with stating expectations about what came back in the response. I expect the response to be, T, to be a 201 status code. Uh, if that's what the specification for the endpoint actually stated. And again, I can state more detailed expectations using the Chai library about the body of the response, if there was, if there happened to be a body in the response. Sometimes uh, I'm saying here, sometimes the response is a very simple kind of structure. Uh, is that what I mean? Is that what I'm, no, it's not, sorry. Uh, there, here I'm just showing you typically what you might contain inside or include inside in the end part of this chain here. So again, I'm still demonstrating making a get request to this particular endpoint in my movies API. And we've dealt with all of this before. Here I'm stating using the super test expectation, I'm stating what I expect the content type in the response to be. And I'm expecting the status to be 200, that's okay. And then in the body, I'm making more detailed statements about the contents of the response that came back. Uh, you'll know from your web API that when I send a get request to slash API slash movies, then it should return back an array of movies. And so that's really what I'm doing here. I'm checking to see that it is an array. I'm checking to see that the length of the array is equal to whatever it should be. Um, and there may be other expectation statements as well. And of course, here's our friend, the done function. And I'm, use, and I'm passing the done function into my it block uh, callback. So that's where done comes into the picture, which we were talking about earlier on. Um, yeah, if the response body is a very simple structure, that would typically, um, well, it could be in any case, but if it is a very simple structure, then you can abbreviate how you code your expectation statements. So here I'm demonstrating, I'm making a get request to slash API slash movies. And let's supposing I give it an invalid movie ID. Now, if I, if you remember from the, um, from the specification for this particular endpoint in your web app dev two module, when an invalid movie ID is passed in a get request, then it returns a simple message structure, something like this, okay? So all I'm doing here is that we've seen all of this be before, but in my last expect statement, I'm just stating that the actual structure of the response should be exactly this. And that's based really on the, uh, the specification and my knowledge of the API. Uh, again, because I'm using the done function, then I do have to call done again. So the way you kind of break down this piece of code here is, as I'm saying here, the expect has a body and a callback. Okay, so you can use the expect that's provided by the super test in many different forms. You can uh, provide, you can execute it in this form where you just specify a value and it understands that really what you're doing there is stating an expectation about the status code you can use the ex expect statement like this, and it understands what you're doing is making an assertion about a particular response header. You can use it like this, where you're stating that you expect the body of the response to be exactly like this structure here. Uh, but when you do that, you can also pass a function to this particular invocation of expect in that function, you can have anything, but typically all you'll want to do is call the done function. 
So this here is the second argument to this expect uh, function call here. So the expect, as I said, the expect that's provided by super test has a number of different formats. And really the, the, these are the three main ones that you, I'm illustrating here. Now, an alternative to using that done function, which is a little bit uh, verbose in terms of the coding, you can use super test using the promise based uh, programming style, and you're familiar with the promise based programming style from Web App Dev 2. And so, when you're using that, and that's really what I will use mainly in the labs, although I'll use the, the other format as well, this is how you code your, uh, your communication using super test with the Web API. So, again, we have our it block, but notice here now I'm not passing any done function to my callback. And you are, I am returning the result of whatever this invocation chain here uh, returns. And in, in fact, what it returns is a promise. But so the key difference is you, you're using the, re, you're returning whatever this expression uh, evaluates to, which, as I said, is a promise. Whereas if I go back to the previous slide, I'm not using any return statement here at all. So, uh, so there's that, and as well, instead of the end function, we use the then function. And so again, this works exactly as before. The effect of this piece of code here is to make a HTTP GET request to this endpoint. Um, I'm expecting the response status to be 200. And then in the then block is where I can write my more detailed expectation statements about the body of the response. There is no invocation of the done function required here at all now. And as before, if the body of the response is a very simple structure, then you can drop the then part and you can have as the very last part of this chain here an invocation of expect where you're specifying the exact content of the body. Uh, so that clearly, this example here, is the promise programming model equivalent of this example here. So it's uh, the promise-based model really is a, a cleaner programming model, and it's the one that we will use mainly in the labs. Now, uh, okay, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna skip over that. I'm gonna flip over to VS Code for a minute. And so here's the API uh, that you've been developing in the labs, and all I've done, and what you will do in next week's lab is, you will add a test folder, and inside of that test folder, I have a movies subfolder. And in there, I'm going to have all my tests for the slash API slash movies part of my API. I have a users folder, which is where I'm going to have all my tests for the slash API slash users part of my API. And uh, there would be other folders as well for the other aspects of it, like the genres, et cetera, et cetera. If I look inside the movies, then Here's my actual test code. And uh, you might remember that so far anyway, the movies part of your, uh, sorry, let's, let's see. Oh yeah, uh, so far anyway, in the web app dev module, the movies part of your API is just storing data in memory. It's not talking to a database, uh, and it, nor is it talking to TMDB. So that's probably uh, a very simple example. But either way, you know, I've got some, I've got my describe blocks in my before block is where I, I'm just going to skip over that because it's not too interesting. Um, you know, I've just got some it blocks here. 
here I'm making a request to the get API slash movies. And we've kind of seen all of this really in the slides. I'm using the callback with my done function there. Whereas down here, I'm using the promise based model. I've commented those out actually for other reasons. Uh, if I flip over to the users part, there's probably a, a more realistic example of what API testing, because as you know from, from the web app dev module in the users part, we are actually using the database. And so I said at the very beginning of this discussion that you need to be aware of the presence of the database and in your tests, you need to make sure that, for example, your database is reinitialized to the same initial state before each test case, this kind of test isolation idea. And also as part of your tests, not only will you be making assertions about the contents of the response that comes back, but you may need to make assertions about has the database changed in the way that you expected it to. So in our tests for the user's endpoint, we will actually be talking to our Mongo database directly. Uh, before I look at this in any kind of detail, now typically when you want to run your tests, uh, what I've done uh, pre beforehand now is I've started my Mongo database locally. So you can see that's happening over here. I have my Mongo database running in, uh, in local mode and I want to run my tests. So I just go NPM test. And what that is going to do is it's going to run all of the tests that I have here. I've only got two test files at the moment. And it's using marker. So, you know, we're getting back the kind of response structure that we're kind of familiar with from when we were doing unit testing. Okay, there's some ugly um, stuff popping up every now and again that isn't necessarily directly related to testing. So that's kind of silent principle is being violated here. And I'll show you in the lab how you might uh, turn that off. But other than that, you can see uh, it looks like all my tests are passing. And uh, just to go back to the user's endpoint tests in there, and again, you'll see this in the lab. I'm actually, you can see here, I'm, I'm importing Mongoose. So I will be within my test code, I will be talking to my database directly, mainly concerned with populating the database with the exact same starting data for, before each test case. And in fact, I do something even more elaborate than that. In my before block, what I'm actually doing in my before block here, I'm making a connection with my database. So you've seen that kind of code before. In my after block, I am essentially just uh, destroying the database that was just created. Uh, so in each for each time I run this test, it's going to create a new database for me. And at the end, it's going to destroy it. Before each individual test case, what I'm doing is I'm deleting the current contents of a particular collection within my database. Looks like the user collection because that's what this test file is focused on, the, the user's endpoint. I'm populating, so I'm deleting everything that's in there at the moment. I'm populating it with a predefined set of users. Users here, uh, I have defined just as a simple array of users up here. So I'm putting the same two users into my database every time. And I'm doing that before each individual test case. And then I have my individual uh, after each test case. Uh, well, what I'm actually doing here is I'm kind of restart, I'm shutting down my express server and restarting it every time. So, uh, so that's fine. Before each test case, I wipe the particular collection, the user's collection, and I repopulate it. And then my individual test cases are the kind of things that I've been talking about where I'm making various requests. So for example, in the post here where I want to add a new user or register a new user, uh, 
I have an after block, which checks to see, has that user actually been added to the database? So in this case here, I'm sending a get request to my API for the particular user that was just added up here. Okay, so that's again, an example of making, uh, or examining the state of your target after a particular test has run. And as I said at the outset, the state here really relates to the content of your database. Okay, so um, not surprisingly really, it hasn't taken me a whole lot of time to, uh, to get through all of this stuff because we know a lot of it already. We know about Marker, we know about Chai, we know about some of the principles of testing. Really all this slide is related to or is communicating is about the fact that uh, sometimes you may have to actually, if you write your mocker code using ES6 syntax, and in particular, if you've got sort of import statements uh, uh, at, its, at its core, mocker is kind of pre-ES6. So you, you may need to, in some cases, compile your Maka test cases back to ES5. Um, now I've, I've kind of walked around that. Uh, and of course, if, if when we're talking about compiling ES6 back to ES5, we're talking about Babel. Um, I've kind of uh, managed to avoid that in the lab. So in a way, this, this slide may not be as relevant as, um, as previously. And so there we are, that's our discussion on web APIs. Uh, so it'll all come down to practicing it in the lab. Now, not surprisingly, the second assignment is focused on web API testing and CICD as well. So we will be reintroducing that, but there isn't anything particularly new in the CICD side, other than deployment, auto deployment. And I'll show you how we are actually gonna handle that. So I think I can actually leave it at that for today's lecture, unless there are any questions. No, okay, so for once I'm finishing ahead of time and I will talk to you on Tuesday. Bye for now.